So my name is Felicia Ward. I am the president and the founder of the Freddie Ford Family Foundation. I have three boys on the autism spectrum, which is why I founded this organization. Um, the goal is to support underserved families impacted by autism and help raise awareness of autism spectrum disorders. We are having a series of webinars and they will touch on various therapies and resources available for families. So, um, our featured speaker is Miss Adrienne Funk. Feel free to wave. <laughs> she is a licensed speech language pathologist. Um, and then our hope with this webinar is just to make sure that we can give a better understanding of what speech um, therapy is, for, especially for parents, because a lot of parents have questions and uh, those questions don't necessarily always get raised or answered, or they may not even know they have questions. So we're trying to demystify and make sure it's really understood why a child might need it, who might need it, how it's implemented, and things like that. So, <clears throat> here's the coffee. So general housekeeping rules, please stay muted. Uh, if you have any questions, we will try to answer those in the last 10 to 15 minutes in a Q&A. Or so you can feel free to submit them written if you don't want to ask it live. And it looks like we have now approached enough time waiting so I think we can get started. So like I said, uh, Adrienne Funk is our featured speaker. And Adrienne, would you like to tell us a little about your background? Sure. Um, so, hi, I am Adrienne Funk. I'll wait for our, I see somebody else joining too, and I want to be sure that they hear. There you hi, go. so I'm Adrienne Funk, and I am a licensed speech pathologist. A little bit about me is that I am from Louisiana. Um, I completed a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and in early intervention from the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, Louisiana. With that degree, I, I was a teacher for about three years. And that's where I met a speech pathologist really for the first time. She and I would co-teach a cooking lesson on Fridays in my class. And I just realized, oh my gosh, I want to be a speech therapist when I grow up. So I convinced my husband that it was a great idea for me to go back to school. And I went back to school and got a master's degree in communication disorders from the, uh, from Louisiana State University in Shreveport, Louisiana. I received that degree in 2011, and I have been a practicing speech pathologist ever since then. As just a little disclaimer, I am on the board of Felicia's organization, the Freddie Ford Foundation, and I am not receiving any monetary compensation for this talk. It is just a talk purely, so as a, as a foundation, we can get out the word about what speech therapy is, how we can help people, and answer questions. So I'm going to kind of get started talking about what speech therapy really is. So as a speech pathologist, people will call us speech teachers, they call it speech therapy, they call it speech and language therapy. We have a lot of names and that's because we really work on a lot of components of communication. So the first part is speech and that is articulation and that covers speech patterns of development and individual sounds that we're making. As it relates to autism, someone with autism may have errors in their speech sounds. So they might say maybe an SH sound instead of an S sound. 
or they may have errors in the patterns that we develop speech. So they may have a pattern where they just don't say the final sound of any words. That may mean that even though they have, or they can say a B sound at the front of the word, their pattern, their speech pattern, is that they never say a B sound or any other sound at the end of the word. So as speech goes, that's something we would work on. Another component of speech therapy or speech and language therapy is language. Language is one of my favorite things and it can sometimes be really big because we talk about expressive language and we talk about receptive language. So receptive language is that ability to understand information. And that involves understanding words, sentences, and meanings of what people are saying or what they're reading. Receptive language really gets to how you understand language in your mind. Another component of language is expressive language. And that means being able to put that, that receptive language out into the world. So turning those thoughts that you have inside your mind into gestures or touches on a picture board or words or sentences. Expressive language is really those things that are coming out of you. Um, and we want that to make sense and we want it to be grammatically accurate. Now, a third component that is touched on more in the clinical-based setting for speech and language therapists is feeding and swallowing. Um, that's typically, like I said, um, a larger focus of private therapy or clinic-based therapy. Part of the reason for that is that we will perform a modified barium swallow study with a radiologist to help diagnose if there is a swallowing problem. Sometimes that can affect someone with autism, but we typically see that, as I said, more in a clinical setting, less in a school-based setting. And as a speech therapist, we have a state board and a national licensing board. Now, every state has specific rules that you need to follow in order to be licensed in that state. And those rules will be, um, will consist mainly of maintaining your license by going to continuing education programs. And then we have a national board, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. We usually refer to that as ASHA. Um, and when you're a member of that association, it means that you have done a year-long um, clinical competency piece where you have worked under a licensed therapist and you are continually doing education, um, whether that is online, something like this, or something that you go to to receive further education. So hopefully that helps kind of set up what a speech pathologist is and kind of what we need to be a speech pathologist, right? So we need our master's degree and then it is best practice to be a member of your state's licensing board and then ASHA's licensing board. The next thing we really wanted to discuss was kind of how someone gets evaluated for speech therapy or language therapy. And there are different routes to go. If your child is school aged, then the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, has a very specific protocol. They have very specific timelines um, and very specific requirements to get someone evaluated and then diagnosed with autism. Now to start that evaluation process, 
a parent that is concerned about their child can certainly go to the teacher or the principal or the educational psychologist, anyone that's working with their child at the school and say, hey, I have a concern for my child. I need them to be evaluated and looked at. And once the parent says that, that starts those timelines and protocols from DESE and we will begin the process of looking at that child with you. Um, besides a parent bringing that up, a teacher or another staff member could have concerns about your child and we could bring it up that way as well. But once that process has begun, then the child will be observed and tested by various individuals. It might be an occupational therapist, there might be an educational psychologist, many people will be involved in this. I will just speak from the speech therapy perspective. So if you have more questions or concerns about the other aspects, I would refer you really to either Desi's website or to talk to your school if you have more concerns about um, maybe the occupational side or the educational psychologist side. But from my perspective as a speech pathologist, we would want to look at this child and see, are there any speech concerns? We covered that idea of articulation, um, your speech sounds. So if there are speech concerns, then we want to assess that. And we have specific tests that are standards based that we look for which sounds does your child have and should they have them at this age or are we missing a sound and do we need to work on it? The other um, testing component is language. So we would look at at least two standard language tests and we want to see which components of language are most difficult for your child. Um, it might be that expressive language is difficult and some parts of expressive language could include vocabulary. They could include pragmatic language. That's kind of the social component. And when I work with students who have autism, most frequently the pragmatics of language, the social communication is a difficulty for them. A further component we look at is if your child is not speaking, well, we want to work with that nonverbal child and see is there an augmented or alternative way that we need to work with this student? Is there another way that they can get what they're thinking of across? So we want to assess for should we use pictures? Should we get a more dynamic device like um, an iPad or another device where the screens change and the child can interact with them? When we do our testing, I don't want it to be scary for the child. I don't want it to be intimidating for the parents. Testing can be done in one session or it can be done in multiple sessions. It just depends on the child. First, we want to really work to build rapport and get to know that child because we want to be sure that this assessment is accurate and a good representation. When we do this assessment, it often includes books, pictures, stories, and frequently a lot of play. An example of that might be that we would place something of interest in front of the child and maybe it's unopened and we wait to see what kind of communication skills they use to get this interesting thing open. So do they just ask, hey, can I open that? Do they make eye contact with me and kind of raise an eyebrow? Do they just ignore it? Because maybe I didn't pick something that they were really into. Um, a follow-up to that then is that I, as the evaluator, would provide some cues to assist in the communication and then think about which of those cues worked. 
So was it helpful for me to ask questions? Was it helpful for me to nudge that interesting thing toward them? All of those things give me insight to what their issue might be with communication. And it gives me an idea of their problem solving skills, their communicative intent. It gives me an idea of their social communication skills and their verbal or nonverbal communication skills. So that's really an overview of evaluation for the school system. So I most want to drive home the fact that teachers and staff can initiate that, but families can also initiate that. Another way that you could get evaluation is through um, home therapy or a clinic-based assessment. So that would be not at a school, but you may have talked with your doctor and thought, oh, there's a concern, but maybe my child is not school-aged yet. Or maybe my child is school-aged, but this isn't a concern that is affecting them in school. So you may have chosen a clinic or a home-based service to come in and do the assessment. So that service will really follow a very similar pattern in that they're still going to observe your child. They're still going to do some standardized assessment, but that's going to be done either at your home or in the clinic. And it is not going to be focused on education, really. Um, as in, it's not going to follow the DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, rules and protocols. And it will most likely be initiated by either you or your doctor. Since it's at home, it's not going to be something that's in the school setting. Hopefully that helps maybe a little bit uh, demystify kind of that evaluation process. I do now, Quick question. So go ahead. Is yeah. there an age range where study is too early or inappropriate for learning speech? So you kind of you kind of cut out. I think that you're we're most just asking about is there an age range for speech? And are you thinking of speech? as in sounds and articulation? Yes. So when you're thinking of speech sounds and articulation sounds, we develop those sounds in a pattern. And an easy way to think of it is we develop those sounds that are right at the front of your mouth first, like the p and the m. Mm. We develop those sounds first, those sounds pretty early. That's why those young children that are about 12 months old will say mama first, because that sound is very visible. Then as you age, you start to acquire sounds that are further back in your mouth and require a little more movement of your tongue and your lips. So things like T and D would be next and the K and the G which is way back in your throat. And then the last sounds that develop, that really develop much later, someone that is seven or eight would really um, have acquired all the sounds. Those last sounds are like the th or the er, the th, those r sounds are the last ones to develop. So there is a pattern to our speech development. When we give assessments, we actually look at the age of the child. We look at whether they're a boy or a girl because boys and girls develop those sounds differently. And then we compare the sounds that the child is using to their age, to whether they're a boy or a girl and determine if they are using the sounds that are appropriate or if they're missing a sound. For example, if a child is say three years old and they're not using the m's or the b's or the p's that would be a concern for me because those sounds should have developed prior but if that same
three-year-old is not saying L's or TH's or R's, that's not a giant concern for me because I would not expect a three-year-old to have those sounds yet. Does that help answer that question? Okay. And anytime you guys have a question, I think Felicia also said you can put it in the chat to her and then she can flag me down. Um, the next portion that we were going to go into is what does speech and language therapy look like? So I divided it up into what does it look like at school? Kind of what does it look like in a clinic or the home setting? And then I really wanted to talk to you guys about play-based therapy versus drill, repeat, and review therapy. So let's start with what therapy looks like at school. We talked about the evaluation from the school perspective. Well, once you finish that evaluation, then you would have an eligibility meeting and decide, yes, we think this child is, is eligible for an educational diagnosis of autism, and we need some speech and language therapy. If that's the case, then we write an IEP, an individual education plan. At school, we strictly follow that plan. So that means that those therapy goals and then those minutes that we decide are specific for your child. And that is to the letter what we do at school. Now in school, your therapy plan is going to be tied to the assessment results from the evaluation. It's going to be tied to the team's discussion. Now that team is going to be the family, the therapist, maybe um, a diagnostician or a social worker. All of those teams will help develop the focus. And then in school particularly, it will be tied to a state standard of education. So whether your child is in kindergarten or 12th grade, we have state standards that say what kids should learn, what they should know by the end of each school year. And when your child has an IEP, we always want to bring the focus of their therapy back to meeting the grade level standard. I know that seems, it can seem kind of convoluted, but hopefully this example will help. If after discussion, we do determine that speech sounds are a difficulty, then we would look at the Missouri State Learning Standards for language and speaking, and we would see if there's an educational reason, an educational standard that we can work on in this area. Now there is a standard that relates to speaking. And the next step would be to write a goal that addresses that standard and the speech concern for your child, right? So the standard might be for first graders that they join in classroom discussions. So we know that if they're having difficulty with that speech component, the sounds, it might be difficult for them to join in class discussions. So we would write a goal for using your speech sounds in class discussions. That way it hits both your child's difficulty with speech sounds and the state standard for education. We work so I do have a little video for you guys I want to show. And it's going to show how we work on those sounds in a session. So in the session, this child is working on SH. It's not me in the video. Um, the therapist has set up a game for them to play. And she set it up so that they're only using SH words and that the therapist is playing as well. So that gives the child the opportunity to hear correct models throughout the game. So I'm gonna share my screen and play this video for you guys now. That way you can kind of get a good idea about 
what speech therapy would look like in a session. What are they? Set. Set. This is Shango. Shango. Good job. Shango. Set. Good job. Sheep. Shovel. I'm helping you with all your matches. <laughs> What'd you get? Shovel. Shovel. Yep, and it's like. Good job. Put those in your skin. You get to go again. Okay. Shawl. Shawl. You got one again. Shawl. It's just this one. Not when you said shawl. That sounds good. Let's do. Yep. Okay, I'm going to take shark, shark, that was a lucky guess. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we watched that video, that is pretty typical of someone who is working just on speech sounds in a school type setting. So then the next piece I wanted to talk about was speech therapy at home or in the clinic. So speech therapy at home or in a clinic is a little different than the school setting. Um, in home therapy, that assessment that we spoke of um, is driven more or focused more on what is important or functional for the family. So at home, they don't have to tie their goals back to an educational standard because they're not covered under the umbrella of DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, so they would have their own qualifiers for therapy in the home or the clinic setting. A clinic or a home-based therapist can see a deficit in one area and choose to work on that one area, whereas in the school setting, we will always need to be tying those things back to a standard. There's a great, um, there's really a great article from the speech bubble Dot com. I'm going to post it on our um, on our website so that you guys can read that a little bit more. It talks a lot about the differences between clinic therapy and school therapy. Because you know your school therapy, that's going to be free appropriate public education. Your clinic or your home-based therapy is something that you as a family have to be looking for. It's also something you as a family will be paying for either out of pocket or through your insurance. Then I want to focus on play-based therapy. I love all types of therapy, but I really have a very strong affinity for play-based or functional therapy. I definitely believe based on just anecdotal evidence with my own children, but also based on research that kids learn through play. Play is really their work. So when I did home-based therapy, I would get this question a lot, especially at the beginning of my tenure with a family. Um, I am sorry, uh, Ms. Funk, but you look like you guys are just playing. Is there really any therapy going on? Like, what the heck am I paying for? Um, and most people were very nice about it, kind of like a wink and a nudge, like, are you really doing something for my kid? Uh, and it makes a lot of sense for people to ask this. So after I fielded a lot of those questions, 
I began to try and kind of head that off at the past by really explaining what play-based therapy is and explaining why I want to work on their functional skills through play that they really enjoy. Because play, like I said, is really the work of a child. It's how they develop communication. It's how they practice problem solving. It's how they discover how the world works. It's how they practice all of their social situations. So a play-based session might look like this, okay? I bring a bag into your house and I set it down in front of your child and I just kind of wait expectantly. Then maybe I model with some gestures or some verbalizations. I model ways to request how to open the bag or I show mm, real interest in my facial expressions about opening the bag. So I'll bring out usually just two things that I am hoping are very interesting to your child. And I watch to see what kind of nonverbal communication they give me, what kind of verbal cues they give me. And I wanna follow those cues so that we start playing with the object that's of highest interest to the child. So maybe that's a dinosaur. And I wanna build that child's receptive language. So I label things as we're playing. The dinosaur goes up on the table. I sound, I use a lot of sound words while we're playing, like rawr or err, ah. Oh. I wanna use a lot of movement words. So as we incorporate movement of ourselves and the dinosaur, because we're taking the dinosaur up onto the table or under the couch, we wanna say, boom, 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 whoa, and really give this child a very immersive and a lot of context in how this play goes. So it looks like play and it is play, but it's also teaching reciprocal communication. It's teaching joint attention because we're both engaged with this dinosaur. It's teaching requesting. Typically, I only bring one dinosaur. So if you want it, you're gonna have to ask me for it in some way. That might be reaching for it. That might be looking at it. Or it might be saying, my turn but it teaches requesting, it teaches labeling, turn-taking. These are really my preferred activities to do, those play-based activities, because I can do them in your home with you and I can get the parents involved. And anytime I can get parents or family or a sibling involved, they can watch it but they can also join and then they can use it later because every moment is a teachable moment. So whether that means that later the brother remembers, oh, when that therapist picked up the dinosaur, she said, rawr. So when I pick up the car, I should say beep beep. That seems like a very small thing but it is constantly building language into their day. You can tell I love that part the best. The other, so there, is, there are other types of therapy. Another type I wanted to touch on is repeat review drill therapy. So frequently, this is the type of therapy people expect. So I show you a card or I show you an item and you label that item, or you match that item, or you key in the button on your device that says that item. And we repeat that, we review it, and we drill it, then we move on to the next card. These are the kind of things um, that we did, you know, when we studied our vocabulary in high school, right? You write down on your note card, biology, then you write on the back of it what biology means, and then you repeat it, you review it, and you drill it. So it's not a bad thing to do. It, and I really have kids that it is very effective for. There are many children that love the routine of that, right? They enjoy the predictability of, all right, here's Miss Funk, 
here's those 20 cards we're about to do. First, it's going to be car, then it's going to be crispy, then it's going to be crane, then it's going to be, you know, and they know exactly what's coming next. And that can be very good as a function to build rapport. It can be very good as a function to build their own knowledge base and also their confidence in their skills. Whether those skills are verbal, whether those skills are nonverbal and using a communication device or matching, it can be a really good thing. But as therapists, we also know that life is not predictable. So once we've done the repeat, the review, the drill, we typically practice a little sabotage, right? So that means maybe we mix up the cards so that they're not in the same order they always are. And it gives another level of thoughtfulness for that child. Maybe we purposefully grab the wrong deck of cards so that then they have to say, whoa, we're not doing, we're not doing clothing we're doing kitchen items and they have to help me find the other cards. Maybe we put the cards in an odd place in the room so that the child has to ask for them or maybe has to describe where they are. Something else I do is I might post the cards on the wall and it just gives a different perspective for that session, right? Instead of sitting down with those cards, well now maybe we stand up and we tap them while we're saying them. We still get the repetition, but adding sabotage to that repeat review drill really helps increase the chance that they're gonna generalize those skills outside the therapy room. Did you have a question, Felicia, or no? <laughs> I'm taking notes to ask them during the Q&A. <laughs> Don't you Take worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. Um, but again, so I ended that kind of by saying that we always want to generalize those skills. So whether it's the play skill, I talked about wanting to do it in the home so that the parents or the siblings could then do it later. Or if it's repeated review and drill, I want to try and add some sabotage so that, sure, they do it with me, and that's great, but I'm not going to be with you all the time. My goal of any of these therapies is that we can get that functional communication for you, whatever that means, whether that's using a communication device or pictures or words. I want to move it from that routine you use with me out to your family, to your friends at school, um, to your community. And a good way to do that is always encouraging questions from the family. So any type of therapy that I do, whether it's school or home-based or in a clinic, we always wanna bring it back to the family because that's the best way to get these skills generalized. I have my own four kids and I want them to be out in the world someday. And the best way to do that is to give them the skills, but work for them to practice those skills outside of just with us. So the next part that we kind of wanted to talk about were, I'm just checking my time, were tips for choosing a therapist, right? Um, because that can be really difficult. This person is working with your kids and that can seem very strange. It can sometimes be a very intimate relationship because kids bring a lot of stuff and they say a lot of things. So it you want to be sure that you're choosing somebody that understands your child and somebody that communicates well with you. If we go back to that divide we had in the beginning, right? When we talked about assessment, we talked about school assessment and then home-based or clinic-based assessment. Then when we talked about 
therapy and providing that therapy, we talked about it from the school perspective, right, following that IEP, and then we talked about it from the home or the clinic-based perspective. So when you choose a therapist or when you're looking at who's going to be working with my kiddo, in the school, it looks different than it does in a home or clinic-based setting. In the school, speech therapists are generally assigned to specific schools in a district. So if you are in St. Louis Public Schools and you go to Farragut Elementary, then there is a speech therapist that goes to Farragut Elementary. And that therapist will be licensed by the state and will have their credentials from ASHA, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. Now, that therapist is usually going to introduce themselves to you in some way. They're going to give you a phone call, they're going to write a letter home or send an email. We always include our contact information with that and from personal experience, I can tell you we are very happy to talk with you and to help clarify IEP goals or minutes um, in your child's IEP. We are also very happy to talk about what type of therapy are we using? Are we focusing on repeated review and drill? Are we doing matching games? Are we doing scavenger hunts? Are we doing play-based and pretend therapy? We would love to talk with you about that. Um, what I thought was you might be considering what are some questions you might want to ask your therapist, right? Because I know when people see my own kids, I'm like, what are you doing? What questions can I think of? Because I want to know what's happening when I'm not there, right? So you might want to ask, is your child being seen with a group? So are they being seen with one or two other kids or are they seen individually by themselves? And then to follow up, your therapist probably has an idea about why they put your child in a group or why they chose to see your child individually. I know for me frequently, if I'm working with a child who has autism and we're focusing maybe on some pragmatic or social skills, like maybe we are focusing on building some communication and some reciprocal communication. Well, after I give you a few scripts with that, you're probably tired of talking to just me about how my day was and answering a question that I give you in return. So I want to build you into a group so that we can use your communication device or we can use your verbal skills to help you transition those, those social skills and that interaction piece to a group of your peers, right? So that might be a reason that your therapist has for providing your child a group setting versus an individual setting. Your therapist, conversely, might want your child to be in an individual setting. Maybe your child is working on the J sound and there's no one else that's working on the J sound. So it's better if they see your child individually so that they can really focus on honing in on that sound. Typically, we really have reasons that we make that choice. We are happy to discuss them with you. And if you feel differently or you have a concern, let us know. We really do want to meet your child where your child is and help with those skills and answering those questions. Another question you might have is, how often are they seen? Now in the school setting, that goes right back to the IEP. You have your IEP goal, and then it will say, your child receives 30 minutes of speech therapy and 60 minutes of language therapy. And that tells you exactly how much they're seen per week. You might ask, what types of reinforcement are we using? Because different kids are motivated by different things, right? 
some kids really love the fruit snacks and will do just move mountains for me if I give them a fruit snack. Some kids love stickers. Some kids just really love a high five or verbal accolades. And you as the family probably have the best idea of what your child works for. You also might have an idea of what you don't want your child working for, right? Because maybe you don't want your child working for food, or maybe you don't want your child working for stickers because you're tired of that getting stuck on their clothes, and then you got a shirt that has sticker stuff all over it. But it's important to talk about those things with your therapist. You might want to ask what activities are we doing in therapy and then the last thing that I always want to bring up and really hope that I can convey is what are some things that we can do at home to help support this therapy because in the school therapy parents aren't there right and so you might just receive a worksheet in the backpack that says bobby had therapy at two o'clock today and he did a great job so what did they do in therapy and what can i do to support that ask that question if you're not if you're maybe not receiving what you need to to help clarify what you can do at home ask that question we're happy to answer it. And then when we flip over to the home-based or the clinic-based therapist, choosing a therapist there will be completely different because in the school setting, that's basically given to you because that therapist works at that school. But in the clinic or at home, you can maybe get um, a better feel for that therapist that you're choosing, right? This person's going to be in your home or you're going to be going to that clinic and spending a lot of time there. You want to be sure that that person is certified by your state and you want to be sure that that person is um, certified through ASHA, the American Speech and Language Hearing Association. At schools, they definitely are. Um, and I would say with reputable companies, they will definitely do that as well. Usually therapists up front have on their business card, I am state licensed and I have, I'm a member of ASHA. But that really is important. As we talked about before, those licensed therapists have to complete continuing education. And that means that they are always learning. They're always thinking about new research and new ways to kind of help reach different types of kids. You wanna think about choosing someone who communicates well with you and someone who communicates well with your child, whatever that means to you, that can look different for different families. That might mean someone that texts frequently with you. Maybe you're a texter and that's how you convey your messages. So you want to be sure that you get someone that's comfortable with that. Maybe that's somebody who leaves the last 10 or 15 minutes of the session open so you can go over what strategies worked today, what you think might work in the future, or what you as a family can work on in the interim between sessions. But you want to be sure that you choose someone that really communicates well with you and with your child. You also want to think about getting a therapist who has your goals in mind. Because everyone has different things that are important to them. And what's important to me may not be what's important to you. And a home therapist will work to focus on the functional communication, the functional expressive or receptive language that is most important to you. And again, in the home, they don't have to bring that back to an educational standard. So for example, your family may frequent McDonald's. Um, I worked with a lovely child who had autism and he used a communication device. He used an iPad with a specific 
communication app on it. And that family loved McDonald's. And this kiddo loved McDonald's. And so what our goals were about, were about focusing on social communication and ordering food from McDonald's using that AAC device. And I think that kind of highlights the difference for me in school therapy and home-based therapy. Because the home-based therapy, this family went to McDonald's a couple times a week because it was a great way for their son to work on social communication. It was a great way for him to use a routine and then expand on it in a very safe and comfortable way. So we would use his AAC device and we would practice greeting the cashiers. We would practice ordering french fries and a Coke. And then we would practice how do we safely put our device away, then pick, you know, go get our soda from the fountain and think about where do we sit? Because if someone is already sitting at that booth that we like, we really can't sit with them because socially that makes an awkward situation. That's a teachable moment that we use there. And then we discover how do we sweep the room and kind of find another place to sit. So in this case, those goals would be very specific to the family. And it may involve, for me, it involved meeting them at McDonald's, which meant I also got to get an apple pie a couple times a week, which is delicious, even though McDonald's does not fry them anymore. I digress. Um, my main thought for you guys is really when we're thinking about speech and communication, Frequently with children who have autism, it does not come naturally, and that's okay, but it does mean we have to explicitly teach it. And as parents, you guys do that by modeling words, modeling your behaviors, and providing context and gestures. And then as speech therapists, we do it by really creating a plan and then we target that need and construct situations that they can practice in. So you guys, I hope that that has really provided you guys with an idea about first what a speech pathologist is and then how do we do evaluations that can be different from school versus home. Then I also wanted to give you an idea of different types of therapy, school-based therapy, home therapy, play therapy. And I also wanted to really talk about how do we pick a therapist as well. I'm hopeful that those components really helped you get an idea of what it is I do. And if you guys have had any questions throughout that, I am happy to answer them. I know that I did, um, I let you know about the uh, speech bubble article. That material is going to be provided for you. And then I think we will also list the DESI website and then ASHA, which is the American Speech Language and Hearing website, so that you know a couple of those main things that I really hit on today. So right now I'm going to go over to a couple questions because we have a little time for that. Um, I do see one that says, what materials do you use when you're conducting an informal evaluation being done virtually? Dun, 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 oh, virtual. Um, and it's, I'm an SLP and I'm working with zero to three. Yay, I love zero to three, they're fun. But I, I mean, I love them all really, even when I work with older high school kids. So when I am doing an evaluation, especially with zero to three, I know I talked about a little bit before, I like to bring things in that are very interesting for kids. Doing things virtual is a different ball game. And I can honestly say there are things that I am 
unexpectedly enjoying about it. Informal observation is definitely an important part. Um, if someone does not know what that is, we have standard um, evaluations and that's where we use a very specific test that is normed on a child's development. And that way we can compare your score to someone else who is of your same age. Now, informal is just what it is. It's less formal. That's where I am watching you in hopefully a more natural environment. And I'm seeing you use your communication skills, whether that's verbal, receptive, or expressive skills in a more informal setting. So it's a little bit more, in my mind, it can be tricky to do virtually, but I'm hoping that when you do that, you have maybe a parent or a caregiver that is also there and that prior to the evaluation, maybe you can either bring a few things over or have that parent or caregiver set a couple things up. Now, I know since you're a speech pathologist, you probably are like me and you're gonna gauge the child. So am I gonna set up all these things out at once or am I gonna hold them back and just do one at a time? Some of the things that I like to use are, um, and they have a lot of them now because it's Halloween, they're those little battery operated lights. They're small, they're handheld. There's usually one little button that clicks it on and off and they'll spin around and it basically just shows little it lights, it blinks little lights. Um, do you know what I'm talking about, Wendy? You get them at Walgreens, okay. Um, Yes. I really, okay. I really love those because you can do turn taking with that. So even though you're not there, right, I have one with me and then they have one mm -hmm. at their house. I can click mine and then see if they can click theirs. You can do some turn taking. You can do some following directions with that. Um, another thing I like to do, and again, I think, I don't want to say it's more difficult to do it virtually, but I think it puts more on the parents or caregivers to do it virtually. And I definitely want to underscore that because there are a lot of parents, unless you're a speech pathologist, that are not in the practice of evaluating children. So another thing that I like to do, and this might be more for maybe your two and three-year-olds, is making Play-Doh. So it's a messy thing, but you can really just do it with salt, flour, and water. Felicia's laughing because I used to make it at her house all the time, and she was always like, oh, that seems great, Adrienne. <laughs> um, but I do love making Play-Doh, and it's something that if the family is comfortable with it, you can put a cup of flour in a Ziploc bag, a half a cup of salt in the Ziploc bag, and then they're just going to need to add about a third to a half of a cup of water. But then what you can do is see about opening the bags. How do... Oh, sorry. Felicia is muting me. Um, if they have a spoon, do they want to scoop it out? Do they want to show mom how to scoop it out? But I love making things. It's a very simple thing. It's just flour, salt, and water. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have it, again, it's very easy to just drop, drop off a Ziploc of flour, you know, a Ziploc lock of salt to mix that one up. Um, and then I would say for the younger kids, they do like the light up thing. And that's something that you can definitely do virtually. Um, another thing that the little kids like is anything that makes a sound. So, I mean, you, you know, you know that, but you could drop off a, f a few different blocks or maybe one of those balls that lights up that bounces and hits. Um, and then you would just really have to ask the family to be a little more involved in kind of setting the camera up so that you can see when they're building with the blocks, is the child interested? Do they try and bat them down? Do they ask for more? I love messy things. So the blocks, anything that kind of spills 
is interesting, but hopefully that those three things maybe are, are helpful and can easily, I feel like easily be used virtually because they're inexpensive. You can drop them off very easily to the family. Um, and then you can easily have a set of those at home. Um, does that help? Yes, I was going to ask you in regards to the informal assessment, any particular checkoff list, uh, developmental milestone stones that you kind of stick with? Do you have anything in particular to share yeah. uh, with me? Yeah, that's, um, oh my gosh, I was about to say that's a really great question, and I hear that every time people have And I can it. share this one with you. I usually will use, yeah, um, I don't have the original here, but... Um, like this one is mommy and me milestone mm -hmm. and it's got like pretty much it's just a communication window um, three to six six to nine and nine to twelve um, but I, I'm always wondering if other SLPs are using different you know yeah. check off, uh, like informal checkoff list for uh, assessments yeah so when I'm doing an informal assessment I actually really like um, ASHA on their website, they have a list. I don't know yeah. if you've probably seen it, but when you go on ASHA, they have a list of, and it's really itemized. It goes by age and it, go, it goes by expressive and receptive communication. And it just lists like bullets of things that kids should be doing by specific ages. I really like that one from ASHA because it goes over a wide range, but it's bullet pointed, so it is fairly easy for me, and I find it easy to present to the parent. To parents. Yes. I've, and I've, and yeah. I've used that. However, like in my case, we look at the child, we have to look at the the, the five domains. Yeah. So we also take into consideration like the social, emotional, adaptive, yeah. cognitive, and even the physical development, because we look yeah. at the child as a whole. Do you do, um, like, the DACY? Like, are you doing the um, the developmental assessment of young children? Well, informally, I... Well, I no, I mean, I just... Yeah. Yes. Informally, yeah. I have to just figure out what works, you know, and depending on the child. But formally, we do the okay. BDI, too. When we're yeah, in the home yeah. face to face. I think, I think I like the one, the informal assessment that you're using. And I do frequently go back to the one from ASHA again, because I just find it, because it's bullet pointed that way, I find it very easy to discuss that with the parents. Um, you might, if you're looking for like some more of those physical skills or fine motor skills. Um, I could definitely talk to one of my OT or PT friends and see if they have like a screener okay. or something that they like to use. Okay, yeah. thank you. Let me know. Yeah, sure. Did you, did you register, Wendy? That way, if I find it, I can I just send Ms. it to you that way. I think tried to help me, okay. I, but I did. I did okay. do that registration. Okay, that's cool. Otherwise, I was going to say, can you shoot her an email? That way she knows, and I can, I can get it to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You know, I have a question for you, and I'm wondering, yeah. in a group setting, like, how does that work? I think you've touched on it some, and I might have missed a touch of it. But um, so when you're working with a child in a group setting, um, what do you try to get out of each child? Like, what is the goal when it's a group? Yeah. So if I'm thinking of a group setting, then I definitely put myself more in the school-minded section of being a speech therapist. And when I'm in a group, usually I'm looking for skills that can be generalized. Um, or I might be working on social skills. But for all of the kids that I work with, I was just looking down because it 
it's a reference to me. I have a notebook for all of my kids and then it has their goals in it. And then for me, each day I see them, I have a goal in mind for that day. So if I see your child maybe at three days a week and I have three goals, I may put one goal on each day. Um, or if I see your child three days a week and I only have one goal, I may divide that goal out into different components so that I am able to work on something specific each day. But when I see kiddos, I have, I keep their name and then I keep their goal right under it next to me so that I can always refer back to what are we focusing on? Are we focusing on social communication? So we need to maybe play shoots and ladders and focus on, on turn taking or asking if it's your turn or telling somebody great job or recognizing when can we joke that someone went down the ladder and when is it maybe not a good time to hit Bobby with like the, ooh, you know, bad joke about going down the slide instead of making it up the ladder. Does that help? I itemize it and that way it gives me a good focus. I also try and keep my groups fairly small. So if your child needs to be in a group, I want to make sure that that group is maybe two or three other kids at the most because more than that, and my attention is so divided that I'm not able to focus on what we really need to be doing. Got it, got it, that makes, that makes sense. And so is there, do you do any modeling of conversations? I find myself with my boys, um, if like we practice greeting, Hi, how are you? And a lot of times mm -hmm. I get back, hi, how are you? <laughs> so, or when we go to a birthday party, happy, tell them happy birthday. Or, or they take, tell you. They say, happy birthday, Brendan. And then they'll say, happy birthday. So that's, that is one thing that mm -hmm. I learned is the trying to um, model appropriate responses and conversations. Is, is that an appropriate way to be um, working with them as a parent? Oh yeah, it totally is. So any time will build their communication skills. So even when dad comes home and you go, hey, nice to see ya. How was your day at work? Then you can bring Brendan in and say, oh, dad just got home from work. I told him, nice to see you. Do you want to say nice to see you or hi? And give him that opportunity too, so that you have provided a successful model first and then given him some scaffolds to climb and be able to follow that through and tell him hi as well. And I always recommend kind of doing it in multiple ways. So it's great to get a kid to learn to say, hi, how's it going? But we definitely say more than just, hi, how's it going? Sometimes we say, hey, sometimes we say, what's up? Sometimes we just wait, you know? So keeping all of those things in your greeting repertoire and using them frequently will also expose them to all of those different types of greetings and help them learn which ones are most appropriate for a situation. So how do you work with kids and get them to communicate with each other? So I find myself this summer, you know, uh, we're stuck here and Brendan <laughs> using Messenger to talk to another friend and play Roblox. Okay, great. But really, he's not talking to me. He's yelling at the screen, follow me. Let's go here. Let's play that. And the other child usually is trying to have a conversation, but yeah, we, we haven't learned how to communicate. So I'm in the background telling them how to respond or to ask questions. Yeah. And uh, 
that gets tricky. So how do we work through that? Yeah. So I know, so I know your son, so I can, uh, I know like his age, mm -hmm. right? And I can think about what might be appropriate for someone his age. Um, and then I'm also thinking about younger kids too. So it's always appropriate to model, but for a child that's a little bit older and maybe they can read a little bit, then when you set them up with their game, you might also set up like a board next to them with a few questions on it, you know, like just simple ones like, what's up? Or how did you do that? And then I think it's also important to remember that we comment a lot. We don't just question. I think frequently in therapy, we're peppering kids with, what is it? Where is it? How does it work? Who does it? When did we find it? You know, we go through all those WH questions. So set him up with a few comments that he can use too. Even just, you know, that's cool or awesome. So if you give him a few of those ideas and reference them, then hopefully he'll hear what you're saying. He'll also see that list of questions and comments that he can use. And then we want to fade out what you're saying and start giving him a little bit more responsibility to that. Um, and then to kind of touch on that virtual piece that we're all doing right now, um, I think the games are really fun to play back and forth virtually. I know a lot of people feel have different levels of comfort with technology. I know something that my own kids did was um, Facebook Messenger when I was there watching them because I'm a creepy mom. Um, but that was nice because there are several games on Facebook Messenger that, that you know, use your your face, use the other friend's face, and another fun one to do that really doesn't involve um, like Facebook or apps or anything like that. You can walk around your room or walk around your backyard and play guessing games. So that can work for young kids that are two or three, right? Like I'm thinking of something that's round and I'm kicking it and then on your phone, you know, they can see, oh, there's a ball. And then you can kick the ball. And if you're with them, you guys can describe something that's at your house and then play with that. But it doesn't, in that way, it doesn't rely on like an app that you need to download or it also doesn't give a lot of those extra visual, um, visual cues that might be distracting if you're working on building more of that social communication. So getting outside with the phone. <laughs> right, 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 right. And then, you know, and I had one other kind of functional communication question. So uh, when you have a child that likes YouTube videos or just videos and movies and then they start to I have found that they start to use expressions correctly that they hear from these different videos and I and I get excited because I'm like okay because it's different when you repeat it right I think there's a I don't, I'm not sure but I think there's a thing uh, where they just repeat what they've heard versus repeat and apply what they've heard. Is that correct? Right, right. Um, and I think bear in mind too that that repetition is okay, especially at first. You know, um, so going back to we talked about those greetings, right? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? So the child might just be repeating that but slowly they're building to repeat that only when they initially greet someone. 
you know? And then they're building and adding maybe more intonation to that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they're building instead of, hi, how are you? It's, hello, how's it going? So maybe they start adding just to know that while we don't want someone to be completely reliant on those scripts, they do help build confidence and they help really establish a routine, which is okay and very necessary for children that have autism and just for children in general. They need that routine of knowing, when do we say this? Exactly, okay, because you know, you think uh, too much technology and using too many videos or allowing them to you know, freely navigate your technology can be, and it can be very tricky, but it also can be very helpful, which is why yeah. I was afraid to sit, pull back too much on, on the videos. Yes, we have to monitor, monitor, monitor everything so it's appropriate visually yeah. and in sound. But yes. you know, I'm finding, you know, you can't totally cut that off because it is a very relevant learning piece. It, can, it really can be. It can, it really can be. And like you said, I think you do have to monitor it. It can also be something you can build on, right? So if there is a video that they like or a particular YouTuber that they like, it you can build on that and build discussion around that. You don't have to always just rely on that YouTuber to tell information and then your child to receive it, you know? You can sit there and watch it with them, have a discussion about what they're talking about, you know? You can help your child ask questions about, you know, maybe the YouTuber is opening a bunch of LOL dolls and you guys can build a discussion around that as well. It doesn't have to just remain reliant on that YouTube person. Yes, because we watch some, um, we have been a fan of watching the ones where they just cut the little balls open to show you the color of the slime. But, you know, that's effective in talking about colors and movement. And And I know something that I've done before is maybe we watch that video, but I will pause it frequently. Like, I will have Play-Doh with me, and then when they open the yellow slime, and they're talking about yellow and they squish the yellow, then I pause it, and we find my yellow Play-Doh. We open my yellow Play-Doh, we play with that yellow business for a little while, then we put that away, we press play, maybe green is next. And then we look at their green, their squishy green stuff, we pause it, and then we find something that I brought that was green. So I think that, yes, we do have to temper our use of that electronic, those electronic devices, but I think they still can be useful. Agreed, agreed. I have definitely found they are incredibly useful. And it's hard to take them away. So there you go. <laughs> that is the challenge, is once they go down that road, uh, yeah, taking them back is really Oh hard. my gosh. Taking it back is so hard. It's war. Well, um, I don't believe I have any other questions. I mean, unless anyone else has any questions, I um. think. Yeah, so so Wendy had asked me about the Play-Doh measurements. I make Play-Doh a lot, Wendy. Um, And if you make a large, I usually make the small batch, um, which is, do you want me to type it or do you want me to just tell you? Yeah, I'll put it in here. (laughs) Well, while you're typing it, if you could say it again, that would be great. Yes, yes. (laughs) <laughs> so, right, because it is recorded and somebody else might want my spectacular Play-Doh recipe. But it's one cup of flour, then it's a, I usually do about a third of a cup of salt. And then I'm going to put a half a cup of water. But 
sometimes that's too much water, sometimes that's too little. So I start with a half a cup and then add a little bit more as I need it. And then you can always add like glitter or food coloring, anything fun can go in there. Yes, and we recommend that you uh, put the cap on the food coloring and put it away yeah. Or the child I'm not responsible list. for food coloring that gets all over things. <laughs> it has happened in carpet, and that's fun too. So keep your coloring safe. Well, Adrian, unless you have any questions directed at you, I think this is a perfect place to stop. No, oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much for letting me share about speech and language therapy. It was wonderful. It's something I enjoy so much. And hopefully, um, you know, maybe we got some questions answered. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This, uh, my name again is Felicia Ford. I am the president and founder of the Freddie Ford Family Foundation. And you just enjoyed a wonderful presentation by Ms. Adrienne Funk regarding de demystifying speech therapy. If you have any additional questions, or would like to shoot an email, I'm more than happy to ask anything via email and get an answer for you. My email, I will enter it in the chat, but it is also, it's very long, so I apologize. Um, Felicia, F-E-L-I-C-I-A, at Freddie, F-R-E-D-D-I-E, Ford Family Foundation. Also, please feel free to get any additional information on our website, which is the Freddie Ford Family Foundation.org. If you have any resources that you would like to share with us, you can also feel free to drop me an email as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Adrienne. It's been lovely. And we will hopefully see you next time for another event. Thank you.